Hi, let's talk about the Snell's law. Let's consider an interface of two media. First and second one with different refractive indexes N1 and N2. The speed of light in the first medium will be V1, in the second V2. Let's consider a light falling at this boundary. So we'll have some wave vector Ki, incident wave, some reflected wave Kr, and some transmitted wave Kt. Okay, let's say we have here alpha, here is angle beta, and here is angle gamma. I don't assume that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So, we have three different waves. So I will have the electric field, which is A times E to the I. And let's assume that we have here frequency omega 1 and in the second medium omega 2. Once again, I don't assume that these, frequency, uh, these frequencies are equal. So I will have omega 1 times t minus, and this is ei, this is ki times r. Okay. And I will have the same for ER, which is equal to some amplitude. It might be a different amplitude. R E to the power of I, omega 1 times T minus KR reflected times R. And for the transmitted wave, I will have A T e to the i, and here is different frequency, omega 2 times t minus kt times r. Now, no matter what is the direction of the electric field, no matter if the electric field is continuous across the boundary or it is not continuous, I can write that with some a times ei plus B times ER must be equal to some constant, some parameter C times ET. These are some ABC, some parameters. So the sum of the electric field in one medium at this point must be equal to the electric field in the second medium. This is sometimes confusing for the students because they are thinking in terms of energy. Of course, the energy of the incident beam must be equal to the sum of the energy of the reflected and transmitted beam. But when it comes to the electric field, the electric field in the first medium must be equal to the electric field in the second medium at this point, with some coefficients. Okay, so we have the sum of the electric field in the first medium with some coefficients, and it must be equal to the electric field in the second medium with some coefficient. So we will have some amplitude times e to the i omega 1 t minus ki times r plus some amplitude, some parameter times e to the i omega 1 t minus kr times r, and this must be equal to some amplitude times e to the i omega 2 t minus k t times r. Okay. So, if you want this equation to be true, in general, for any time t, then it means the exponents of these three expressions must be equal. So 
omega 1 t minus k pi times r must be equal to omega 1 t minus k r times r and must be equal to omega 2 times t minus kt times r. Let's take another one. Why we have to assume that all the exponents are equal? Because if we want this equation to be true for any time, then the exponents must be equal, because exponential function is orthogonal. Even if you change the amplitudes, this equation will not be fulfilled if the exponents are different. And the same here, we have time, which is orthogonal to the space coordinates. So, in order for this equation to be true, then omega 1 must be equal to omega 2. So, this is the first very important conclusion that omega 1 equals omega 2. So the frequency of the wave of the light traveling from one medium to another is conserved. So if I have frequency omega 1 here, then this omega 2 must be equal to omega 1. And it is very good because frequency corresponds to a color, not the wavelengths. We sometimes say that we have a laser of 632 nanometers and this is red, but it is not true. The 632 nanometers is red in the air, but in different media these wavelengths will correspond to different colors. Keep in mind that frequency corresponds to a color, and the frequency does not change when the light travels from one medium to another. Okay, let's move on. We also want this, let's say this is z, which is equal to zero. We'll have here, let's say, y coordinate, z coordinate, and some x coordinate, which is perpendicular to this plane and is pointed up. So this is x, x, y, and z. So this line is just z equals zero. So at this boundary, we can assume that ki r must be equal to kr times r and must be equal to kt times r. We assume that this must be true for z which is equal to zero. So we have ki, the x component, times x plus ki, the y component, times y. And this must be equal to kr, the x component, times x, plus kr, the y component, times y. And this must be equal to kt, the x component times x, plus kt, y component times y. So once again, because x and y are orthogonal, then ki x component must be equal to the x component of r, kr, and must be equal to the kt x component. And the same for the y component. So ki y component must be equal to kr y component and must be equal to kt y component. Which means that the parallel component of the wave vector is conserved. So, the parallel component of the wave vector is conserved when the wave travels from one medium to the other.
So this is a very important conclusion because the parallel component of the wave vector is conserved. The parallel component of the incident beam, reflected beam and transmitted beam is equal. So it also means that the incident beam reflected and transmitted lies in a single plane which is called a plane of incidence. As we know that omega 1 equals omega 2 and we know that we can express omega as k times velocity, we can write that ki times velocity in the first medium must be equal to kr times v1 must be equal to kt times velocity in the second medium which means that ki equals kr so the length of the wave vector of the incident and reflected beam is the same moreover kt can be expressed as v1 over v2 times let's say ki we assume that we have an angle of incidence alpha and the angle of reflection gamma so we can write that ki times sine alpha which is the parallel component of the ki must be equal to kr times sine gamma and also it must be equal to kt times sine beta because the parallel component of the wave vectors must be conserved across the boundary. So we know that Ki and Kr are the same, so sine alpha must be equal to sine gamma, which means that alpha equals gamma. So we proved that the angle of incidence must be equal to the angle of reflection. Okay, so we know that Ki sine alpha must be equal to kt sine beta and we know that kt is v1 over v2 ki so let's substitute kt with this expression so we'll have ki sine alpha equals v1 over v2 times ki sine beta so sine alpha over sine beta equals v1 over v2 we also know that velocity is the speed of light over refractive index so we can write that sine alpha over sine beta equals v1 will be c over n1 and v2 will be c over n2 so this will be n2 over n1 and this is a well-known Snell's law so let's conclude we proved that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection we proved that omega 1 must be equal to omega 2 so the frequency is conserved when the light travels from one medium to the other we also proved that the parallel component of the wave vector is conserved and that the length of the wave vector of the incident and reflected beams are equal and finally, we proved the Snell's law that the ratio of the sine of the angle of incidence to the sine of the angle of refraction 
is equal to the ratio of the refractive index of these two media. Moreover, if we prove the Snell's law, now we can talk about the total internal reflection. Let's consider two media once again, one and two. And let's imagine that we have refractive index N2, which is lower than N1. Here is N1, which is greater. So, for instance, this is glass. And this might be a uh, so the refractive index N2 is 1. And we have some light falling at this boundary. And it is reflected, and obviously it is also transmitted. So I have incident beam reflected and transmitted. I know that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And here we have beta angle of refraction. So from the Snell's law, we know that sine alpha over sine beta is equal to n2 over n1. When we increase the angle of incidence alpha, also the angle of refraction increases. And at some point, beta can be equal to pi over 2. So it will be equal to 90 degrees. And the transmitted ray will travel along the boundary of these two media. So this will be transmitted ray, transmitted wave. In such case, we have sine alpha over sine beta, which is sine pi over 2, which is equal to 1, equals n2 over n1. So this equals 1. So we have sine alpha, which is equal to n2 over n1. So from this equation, we can calculate alpha, which is arc sine function of n2 over n1. And this angle is called a critical angle of incidence, because if you increase even further the angle of incidence beyond this critical angle, then there will be no transmitted wave. So all the energy goes back to the first medium. So all the energy which falls at the boundary is reflected backwards. And this is how the waveguides work. The light is reflected from the boundary between glass and air or glass and some other medium which refractive index is lower than the glass and all the energy goes back to the first medium. So total internal reflection occurs when the angle of incidence alpha is greater than the critical angle, which can be expressed as arc sine of the ratio of refractive indexes of these two media. If you have questions, put them in the comments below. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye.